play. Hopefully. Please play. There we go. Uh, this is collecting uh, three axis accelerometry data 100 times a second. Uh, so it's an extraordinary resolution and allows you to reconstruct a virtual first person whale shark. Uh, and so this is the track that we get. Colin Ware uh, wrote the software for this called Trackplot. Uh, and you can see this sort of path with a little wiggle in it. Every one of those wiggles is a tail beat. So that's the kind of behavioral resolution we've got. And you know exactly what this animal's doing. We've managed to put these tags out at this Afuera location and go back three days later and pull the tag off the same animal. It's really cool. And you get three days of the life of a whale shark in excruciating detail. Uh, every, every dive, every surface, every defecation event, you can see it all. <laughs> uh, and it's really started to to answer some questions for us, but also to pose more really cool ones that we didn't know about, uh, that we hadn't even thought about before. What's that behavior? We don't really know. So uh, just sifting through those data is proving to be a significant amount of work, but it's really cool fun. We've also done a lot of photo ID. In the beginning, I sort of thought photo ID work was kind of soft science. It's the sort of thing that aquariums do all the time. Oh, we do photo ID, that's research, right? Well, actually, it kind of is, as I thought, What's really going to do for you? It allowed us to do things like this. You can estimate the number of whale sharks in the population from a discovery curve, extrapolating that curve out, the discovery curve, to an asymptote. And we estimated that we had about 1,274 whale sharks in this population. What we had got from conventional ta mark and release methods was 1,350 animals. So definitely a pretty close kind of estimate based on, uh, on photo ID. The other thing I didn't anticipate was learning about whale shark healing. Here's an animal that's been hit by a boat, a couple of prop cuts. This is about six inches into the meat, if you need some scale. Uh, we're on the leading edge of the dorsal fin. And we uh, photographed this animal in 2011 in August, MXA 281. We know that from the spot pattern on the side here. Uh, and we went back 13 months later, and that injury, except for this little nick here, is almost completely gone. They have extraordinary healing capacity, and we wouldn't have known that had we not had an individual identity attached to this animal based on its fo as photo ID spot pattern. So I've become a convert to photo ID and pretty much standard practice for us now when we get in to take photo IDs on us. In fact, it's our default behavior. If you've got nothing else to do, get in the water and take photo IDs because you're building stories about animals. We're up to about 1,050 individual animals, so we think we're about four-fifths of the way through censusing this population. Remember that photo I showed you before with the six boats in it? That was 2010, this is 2012. Um, in two years, you can see the increase in popularity of this ecotourism activity. See all the boats streaming in from Cancun, and it, this is Isla Mujeres over here, a little island off the coast of, of Cancun, and the ecotourism pressure is now intense. Uh, we've gone from having 10 boats registered in 2004 to 280 boats registered this year. And it's very common now to go out and have more boats than there are whale sharks, even though this is the largest whale shark aggregation in the world. So the ecotourism pressure is really uh, getting a bit out of control. There are 13 people and a whale shark in this photo. Uh, whale shark, is it, is it doing that subsurface active suction feeding? No, it's staying below the surface because it's getting harassed. These people are all over it like, like flies. And then it, any whale shark is going to say, I'm not going to go to the surface. Even though the eggs are floating and that's, if they want to feed, that's where they have to be, they can't do it because these people are all over them. These people may not be breaking the rules. You're supposed to have two people and a guide in the water at once. But if you have two people and a guide from this boat, two people and a guide from this boat, and two people and a guide from this boat, you see you can rapidly have two dozen people on a, on a whale shark very quickly. I thought this was really bad until I saw someone showed me a video from the Maldives where it had 116 people swimming on a whale shark. Um, it looked like the start of an Ironman triathlon. It was insane. Uh, so, so ecotourism, we call it loving them to death, is a significant conservation threat to these animals. We like to think of ecotourism as a good thing, right? You want to engage people with nature. Uh, no, not in this case, because it's not regulated, and these ecotour operators have proven completely incapable of regulating themselves. It's a classic tragedy of the commons, and this thing is going to end in disaster pretty soon. A lot of these people have no idea what they're doing. There's 500 horsepower of outboards strapped to the back of every one of these boats. Someone's going to get seriously hurt pretty soon. But wait, it gets better! <clears throat> and we have a commercial shipping lane. Uh, this is the western entrance of the Gulf of Mexico, one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Everything that comes and goes from Galveston uh, or uh, Houston going to Central or South America goes right past this area. And if they're going anywhere near Cozumel, they go right over the top of these animals. And this is, I can't do much better than showing you the habitat conflict between whale sharks and commercial shipping in this area, except 
show you perhaps this one, which, sorry about the quality, I took it with my cell phone. This is whale sharks, whale shark, people, small boats, commercial ship, all in one frame. Uh, it is a serious, serious problem, uh, and it's going to result in tragedy soon. This year, we had a boat, one of these boats actually broke off the group and went over and buzzed the front of a commercial ship in order to make him turn away because he was going to plow through the middle of the group. So he risked himself uh, to save the rest of us uh, and because the guy who was at the helm, I guess, wasn't paying attention, didn't see that there were, you know, 85 boats in front of him. Um, and so we had, a, we had a near disaster and it's just a matter of time before this cocktail goes horribly, horribly wrong. One of the things we've done to try to help this is to start monitoring ship traffic. This is an observation tower at Isla Contoy National Park, and we put a, a, an AIS ship monitoring system on top of that tower so that we can now monitor all the ship traffic in the western entrance to the Gulf of Mexico, which was previously not covered, which I found extraordinary for those of you who know anything about AIS. So every big commercial ship is required to carry a transmitter that broadcasts its position and identity at all times. So you can put up these receivers that will listen for these transmissions and give you real-time data about where ships are. And so we can sort of see that at any given time, you know, these are the boats, and this is how, what the data looks like. And this, is, this area with the circle is where the whale sharks are, and you can see that this vessel, the Atlantic Sun, is about to drive right through the middle of them. So. This ship is a whole interesting story. It ended up parking itself in a marine protected area and we had to have a social media campaign to get it removed. Uh, but it, uh, uh, another value of social media, right? Activism. So we needed to get rid of this ship and we did it with social media. So, uh, so really cool uh, moving. You can see we're moving gradually from natural history into orthodox conservation activities down there and that's, that's kind of cool. Ultimately, we would really like to put a demarcation buoy there so we can tell all the ships to go three miles to the east. It's not really their fault that they're driving over the top of the whale sharks. Nobody's ever told them that they're there. It's not marked on any chart. There's no broadcast over the marine radio system to tell them what the hazards are. So we would really like to put a nav buoy there to tell people, okay, you need to deviate your course three miles to the east so that you don't, do, you don't hit this. Some of the worst offenders, Carnival Cruise Lines goes right over the top of it. It's not their fault. I'm not singling out Carnival Cruise Lines, except that they go to and from a Cozumel all the time. Uh, and so they go right over the top of it because they don't know that the whale sharks are there. But the whale sharks aren't the only thing that's there. And this bonanza happens with the tunas. We get a bunch of mantas as well. And last year, we probably had more mantas than whale sharks. So we're now dealing with the prospect that this is not just the biggest whale shark aggregation in the world, but probably also the biggest manta ray aggregation as well had hundreds and hundreds of manta rays, far more than they see in Maldives at Hanafaru, which is supposed to be the biggest aggregation there is. We see other things, mobulas, the devil rays. Uh, if you go there in the, in the winter time, it's primo sailfish season. That sailfish bait ball scene from the Blue Planet documentaries was filmed in exactly the same location. Uh, there's also even some remnant reefs, the northern end of the of the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, which is supposed to end at Puerto Morelos, but there is actually still some pretty healthy reef at Isla Contoy. That's where this was taken. So. Why is all of this happening? Well, it's all oceanographic. Uh, so it's to do with the change in the coastline here. Uh, south of Cancun, it's the narrowest continental shelf uh, in the Caribbean. You can see it's pretty much within sight of the coast. Uh, once you come around the corner, it rapidly becomes the widest continental shelf in the Caribbean. It goes from being less than a mile to being over 200 miles wide. The coast makes more than a 90 degree turn to the left. Uh, and uh, so we have these three places where whale sharks and other animals gather. And it's all because this uh, shelf break is like that and the current comes up from the south, interacts with a few coastal features, Cozumel itself and then the Arrowsmith Bank, and spins these eddies up onto the... The, uh, the Yucatan shelf there into the, the reach of the sun and we get tremendous productivity there. That's why the tuna go there to spawn so that their babies have something to eat and then the whale sharks turn up to eat the tuna babies and you get this whole thing that builds on itself an extraordinarily productive ecosystem. I'd like to close by bringing it all back to the aquarium because for me that's where it all starts and ends is with moments like this where uh, we are creating experiences like this for these young uh, people to come face to face with the world's largest fish, which is something that was not possible uh, even 10 years ago. Uh, and so uh, I really love this picture because it, to me it captures what we're all about. Take a moment like this, you can see these kids having their minds blown by this experience, even reaching out to touch, touch the animal almost. Uh, and in that moment they're pretty much susceptible or amenable to receiving any kind of science or conservation messaging we want to give them. Uh, and it's, true, it's a truism that if you ask a lot of marine biologists 
what got you inter interested, Sylvia Earle's a good example. She always cites her experiences in public aquariums as seminal uh, events in the history of her relationship with the ocean. So um, you never know when you're looking at an event like this, are you creating a new Sylvia Earle or a new Bob Ballard or a new whoever, insert prominent marine biologist here, uh, you, you know, this is a, a very important event for us. And so t I take that stuff very seriously and we like to go and, and give them as much good science as we can and to leverage this extraordinary collection to go out and, and learn some things and fill some of the knowledge gaps that we have. Because I think in 2014 it's kind of embarrassing that we know so little about one of the ocean's largest creatures. So thank you so much for having me here today. I've really had a ball and look forward to talking to you more. <laughs> Cheers. I'll take any questions you have about whale sharks or aquariums or anything. Yep. The, um, near to the last figure you had about the oceanography, mm -hmm. that's what I was wondering about during this whole thing is about what concentrates in there. These, when you make these one four eddies like this, they, you expect them to propagate. So why is the trap to a location? Do the areas where you see the congregations move? Uh, I've probably taken a little bit of license in showing them quite so structured as that. We do see eddies. You can actually see them from an aeroplane if you're careful. When it's around the northern end of Arrowsmith Bank, you can see eddies forming. And those are it's not wind-forcing type eddies. I think that's just interacting with the bank uh, as the current comes by. I don't know that they get trapped there. It's quite possible that they do propagate out across the Yucatan Shelf. One of the things that I'd really like to see is what's happening a little further offshore because right now all of our survey is uh, defined, our survey area is defined by the boat range of a small center console or the flying range of a Cessna 206. So if we can't reach beyond that, we don't see, I'd really like to know what's happening further out along the, the, the Yucatan Shelf where I'm sure there's, there's more mixing. Actually, I'm pretty sure once they're up on the shelf like that because it's pretty shallow, I'm pretty sure it's completely mixed. Um, we get these periodic events that the locals call Aguas de Negra, which is the black water, and it's, um, I think it's just straight up upwelling. I'm not sure that it's eddy driven, it might be wind driven, I'm not sure, but they, you get these periods where the cold, murky stuff comes quite close to the surface. Most of the time in this area, it's about 120 feet of crystal clear, 85 degree blue water, and then 10 feet on the bottom of murky, 65 degree goo. Uh, you go down into it and you get to the bottom and you... <laughs> that kind of thing when you're diving. Uh, but times of the year, that comes all the way to the surface, and we don't bother going out for whale sharks at those times, but I think that might be important for sponsoring the rest of what's happening there. But I really need physical oceanographers' input into this stuff. I've struggled to find good data, good monitoring data for this area, so if you guys are aware or if you want to help us understand the oceanographic context for what we're seeing uh, as a... As an oceanographer, I make a pretty good marine biologist, so I, I really could use some oceanographic help. So, yeah, any help you can offer would be great. Yes? Have you worked uh, with the marine? Have you found from the Mexican authorities with regards to regulating native tourism? Thank you so much for asking me that, <laughs> for asking me the obvious question that I deliberately avoided. Yeah, um, <laughs> so uh, I'd have to say it's been kind of mixed. Um, uh, on the face of it, everybody seems willing to and, and interested in um, uh, doing something to preserve the long-term health of this. But here we are five or six years into this event and it's, they still seem paralyzed to actually do something. A lot of it is jurisdictional. This is not happening inside a marine protected area. So CONAMP, the Department of Protected Areas, is not responsible. Profepa, which is fisheries, I guess, uh, is not responsible because it's not a fishery species. So... Uh, all the while, while this bickering takes place, the ecotourism keeps creeping up. So we've tried, uh, we've tried direct engagement with the government agencies. There are some personality politics problems there that we're still working our way through. We have to be sensitive coming in of the gringo effect. Uh, I, I often tell people, hey, I'm soy Australian, <laughs> not, not, uh, not, Amer not American, uh, but yeah, it's, I'm still a gringo as far as they're concerned. So you've got to be real careful about going and telling other people how to manage their natural resources, but somebody needs to do something. My feeling is it's probably going to take a disaster. It's going to take a human disaster. It's going to take someone getting run over by a boat to get the governor's attention, to get the minister of tourism's attention. Actually, tourism is probably one of the avenues that we've explored least getting the tourism department to manage this because the, right now the tourist experience there is much less than it could be. 
because there are way too many boats. And one thing they do, they are very good at in Cancun, is protecting tourism. So perhaps that's another way that we could go rather than working through orthodox marine protected area type situations. But yeah, it's been, so far the response has been really mixed and not particularly effective. So. Yes? Do you have an early warning system with your AIS? Or do you actually... It's real time. So if you go to marinetraffic.com, you can, you can watch it. You can watch it happening in real time. Yeah. Um, well, I don't directly. No. So what we did was with that with the Atlantic Sun that that ship. Yeah. With Atlantic Sun, we uh, when we saw the ship violating marine protected area, we contacted the people from Conamp and told them there is a ship inside your marine protected area, and they did nothing. And after after two weeks, they still had done nothing, and that was when we started with the social media thing. And within 24 hours, the ship was gone. So. Sharks. Uh, so it's not really affecting the sharks in both situations, both in Belize and in Mexico. What it's doing is driving the fish spawning events that the whale sharks are there to feed on. So in, in the case of both the Gladden Spit, where the snappers and, uh, and groupers go to spawn, and here, where we see, we see cyclical variation in the tuna spawning as a function of the moon, uh, the whale sharks pretty much reflect that. So it's really, it really defines how the fish spawn, and then the whale sharks just reflect that. So, so, yeah. Um, you oh, um, good. <laughs> I was just wondering um, that with the increase in ecotourism, have you seen any, uh, anything that's really showing the stress on the whale sharks, such as decreased numbers, decreased growth rate, anything like that? Um, we haven't had enough time to capture a lot of that stuff. Uh, I can tell you that in Ningaloo in Western Australia, uh, where they've been uh, watching whale shark ecotourism for about 25 years, uh, there has been a measurable decrease in mean size and the mean number of animals that have been visiting. And that is one of the best managed ecotourism operations in the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a bit pessimistic, actually, about what's happening here. I'm waiting for the day when the whale sharks just say, to hell with it, I'm going, I'm going somewhere else because this is just not worth it. There will be a time when they get so, such little amount of time spent feeding that it is literally not worth their being there and they'll go somewhere else and I don't know when that's going to happen. I'm a bit pessimistic about it. Human nature is involved. So, yep. Um, you had briefly mentioned antibodies or antibodies. Last week we had uh, <coughs> somebody discussing the immune system of uh, uh, Jawless fish and I think there was some mention of, I'm not a particularly um, up with the antibody immunologies or but is there anything interesting to mention? Anything well, we know that sharks have uh, two classes of antibodies that we don't have. Um, I think it's IgZ and IgNAR. Um, I don't know because I'm not an immunologist. But they don't have the exact same classes of, of antibodies that we have. And they don't have the exact same classes of antibodies that the jawless fishes have. So your person wasn't from Max Cooper's lab at Emory, were they? Uh, whoever it was. <laughs> well, in any case, the, uh, the group that's particularly interested at Emory studies exactly that. They study the, the immunogenomics in jawless fishes because it's a really interesting model. It's the last, last stop before the jaws and the antibodies arrive on the evolutionary tree. So, uh, so no, we know that they have different classes, but what they have uh, written in their DNA is another question, and we haven't seen that yet. We just got, excuse me, we just got the assembly two days ago, so uh, we've got students working away feverishly on it, but the first paper will be just pretty much a genome announcement, and then we'll, we'll dig in a little deeper. What's their growth rate? <coughs> and also, do you have any idea how big they are when they're born? So we know that when they're born, they're uh, about two feet long. Um, they are live, they're oververiparous, so they have egg, leathery egg cases that hatch in utero. And the female that was looked at in the paper creatively titled Mega Mama Supreme, uh, I'm not kidding, that's what the paper was called, uh, she had 300 babies in her, um, so by far the largest litter size of any shark, and um, that probably reflects a delayed maturation. They spend a lot on somatic growth. Uh, they have a gape evasion strategy of trying to outgrow the mouths of the things that want to eat them, so they grow as quickly as they can early. Uh, so they come out about two feet long. Nobody knows where those animals are. So we've seen that the newborns, I think there are three records, two from the Philippines and one from St. Lucia, uh, of, of newborns found swimming, free swimming in the ocean. Uh, <clears throat> the, that mega mama was a really interesting animal because she had 300 babies. They were all uh, genetically had the same father, but they were at uh, every range of uh, development from 
post uh, fertilization all the way through ready to be born. So they either have embryo diapause or more likely sperm storage. Um, and so male whale sharks probably only get one shot at it uh, from time to time. And then, then the girls hold on to it for the rest of the time and, and, and use it. That makes sense if you think about how big they are. Mating in whale sharks has to be some kind of... I mean, you think mating elephants is complicated. Mating whale sharks is even harder. So. Uh, you had another question about, them, about their growth rate, right? Yeah, how fast they grow. So nobody knows in the field. I can tell you that in the aquarium, you can throttle their growth rate very effectively with their food ration. Uh, but they, in, when they first came to us, they were growing about three feet a year. Uh, we decided that was not a sustainable trajectory, so we eased them back a little bit. At that time, we were pretty much ad libitum feeding them until we realized that they're like goldfish. They will just keep eating whatever you put in front of them. I think it's because they have a boom and bust feeding strategy in nature where they go from hot spot to hot spot, uh, and then they traverse vast expanses of empty ocean in between. So when the getting's good, they get getting uh, with eating. So in the aquarium, we decided it was probably better to ease back a little bit and, and be a bit more uh, uh, circumspect about how much food we give them. They're, they're yeah, perfectly... Feed them in the aquarium? They're fed from small boats. Uh, we like to uh, rep uh, replicate what they do in nature. So we have small boats and we have taglines that run along the tank and you go in there and clip a carabiner on the tagline and they just pull themselves along in these little ducky boats and lay trails of krill in the water and the whale sharks just swim through with the active surface suction feeding. Uh, we can, and we did in the beginning, feed them vertically. Then we realized that even with a 30-foot deep tank, at one point they're going to be dragging their tails on the bottom, and we didn't want to encourage that behavior. So we have them feed in what we call the active surface suction mode, not the vertical feeding mode. So. Yes? No, I mean, we've, I think we've, everyone in the aquarium is fairly certain that it had something to do with antiparasitic treatment that we added to the exhibit at the time to control a leech parasite problem we were having. It wasn't even a parasite of whale sharks. It was a parasite of demersal rays, <coughs> but it was a very persistent and, and damaging thing that was killing some animals in the collection. So they chose to treat the exhibit, as you often have to do with herd management in aquariums. You have to treat the whole exhibit as being contaminated. And it turned out that out of the 57 species we had in the exhibit, there were two that were exquisitely sensitive to this drug. One was the black blotch fantail ray, and the other one, apparently, was the whale shark. We don't know for sure because it was um, uh, organophosphate, and they don't leave a lot of tissue residues, and we, hadn't, we didn't have validated acetylcholinesterase assays, assays at the time for whale sharks. So uh, not able to, to know for sure. But given that all other things were pretty much equal, that was the only thing that had changed in recent times. And uh, the two males that were exposed to more treatments than the females, which arrived in the middle of the course of the treatment, uh, the two males were the ones that stopped eating and the females didn't stop eating. So I think most of us feel it was probably a cumulative effect of exposure to the, to the drug that we were using to treat for the leech. You'll be surprised to hear we don't use that drug anymore. So. Right. It was a, a lesson hard learned, unfortunately. Just a quick follow up to James' question. So, on average, how much krill do you go through in a year? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, yes, we, to answer the second part first, yes, we get a discount for buying in bulk. We actually buy most of our food in bulk, and that's because most of them are seasonally harvested. So when we buy capelin, which is one of our staple foods, we buy 400,000 pounds of capelin at once. Uh, 